Hail and well met, Fulcrum Knights and those who are yet to join the Order. It's an exciting time here on the Fulcrum Entertainment Channel. Not only have I been very pleased to see that we have part two of our Halo audiobook dropped from my good friend Gilbert, I'm very excited to listen to that, but also I'm a little bit bored, so I've decided I'm going to start reading another book, one that we did live once here on the channel, Star Wars Allegiance by Timothy Zahn, that classic Star Wars Extended Universe author. I'm hoping I'll be able to keep two books going, but hey, this may be a little bit more of a sporadic series if so, but I hope you enjoy it anyway. I'm excited to get back into it. So, let's begin with Chapter 1. The Imperial Star Destroyer Reprisal slipped silently through the blackness of space, preparing itself for action against the rebel forces threatening to tear the galaxy apart. Standing on the command walkway, his hands clasped behind him, Captain Kendall Ozel gazed out at the planet teardrop directly ahead, a mixture of anticipation and dark brooding swirling through him. As far as he was concerned, the entire planet was a snake pit, crawling with smugglers, third-rate pirate gangs and other dregs of society. If he'd been in command of the Death Star, instead of that idiot Tarkin, he mused. He would have picked some place like Teardrop instead of Alderaan for the weapon's first serious field test. But he hadn't been in charge, and now both Tarkin and the Death Star were gone, blown to shrapnel off Yavin 4. In a single, awful moment, the Rebel Alliance had morphed from a minor nuisance to a bitter enemy and Imperial Center had responded. Less than three days ago, the word had come down to show no mercy to either the rebels or their sympathizers. Not that Ozel would have shown any mercy at any rate. Eliminating rebels and rebel sympathizers had become the best and fastest way to success in the Imperial fleet. Perhaps all the way to an admiral's rank bars. Status, he called behind them. Forty-seven standard minutes to orbit, sir, the navigation officer called from the crew pits. Ozzel nodded. Keep a watch, he ordered. No one gets off that planet. He glowered at the faintly lit disc ahead of them. No one, he added softly. Luke! Han Solo called from the Millennium Falcon's cockpit. Come on, kid, move it. We're on a tight schedule here. They're in! Luke Skywalker's voice came back. Ramp sealed! Han already knew that from his control board readouts, of course. If the kids stuck around, he'd have to learn not to clutter the ship's atmosphere with unnecessary chatter. Okay, Chewie, hit it, he said. Beside him, Chewbacca gave a rolling trill of acknowledgement and the Falcon lifted smoothly off the hard-packed teardrop ground. Apparently not smoothly enough. From behind, Han heard a couple of muffled and rather indignant exclamations. Hey! someone shouted. Han rolled his eyes as he fed power to the sublight engines. This is absolutely the last time we take on passengers, he told his partner firmly. Chewbacca's reply was squarely to the point and a shade on the disrespectful side. No, I mean it, Han insisted. From now on, if they don't pay, they don't fly. From behind him came footsteps, and he glanced back as Luke dropped into the seat behind Chewbacca. There are settled, he announced. Great, Han said sarcastically. Once we make hyperspace, I'll take their drink orders. Oh, come on, Luke chided him. Anyway, you think this is stiff? You should have seen the ones who got out on the earlier transports. These are just the techs who were in charge of packing up the last few crates of equipment. Han grimaced. Crates which were currently filling the Falcon's holds, leaving no room for paying cargo, even if he managed to find some on his way to the rendezvous. This was going to be a complete 100% charity run, like everything else he and Chewbacca had done for Luke and his new friends in the Rebel Alliance. Yeah, well, 
I've seen plenty of useless text before, he muttered. He was waiting for Luke to come to the text defense when a splatter of laser fire ricocheted off the rear deflector. What the? He snarled, throwing the Falcon into a tight drop loop. The instinctive maneuver probably saved their skins. Another burst shot through the space they'd just left, this one coming from a different direction. Han twisted the ship back around, hoping fleetingly that their passengers were still strapped in, then took a second to check the aft display. One glance at the half-dozen mismatched ships rising behind them was all he needed. Pirates! He snapped to the others, throwing power to the engines and angling the ship upward. Facing pirates deep inside a planet's gravity well, with no cover and no chance of quick escape to hyperspace, was about the worst situation a pilot could encounter. And even the Falcon couldn't outmaneuver this many ships forever. Chewie, get us up and out, he said, throwing off his straps. Come on, Luke. The kid was already on it, heading down the cockpit tunnel at a dead run. Han followed, rounding the corner in time to see Luke duck past the passengers crammed into the wraparound seat and head up the ladder to the upper quad laser station. Captain? One of the passengers called. Save it! Han shot back, grabbing the ladder and sliding down toward the lower quads. He caught himself as the gravity around him did its 90 degree shift, then dropped into the seat. It looked even worse from down here than it had from the cockpit. A second wave of pirate ships had joined the first, this group pumping laser fire all around the edges of the first group, forming a deadly cylinder of death around the Falcon's flight vector. They were trying to force their prey to stay on that line so that the first group could chase them down. Well, they were in for a surprise. Keying the quads with one hand, he snagged his headset with the other and jammed it on. Luke? I'm here. Any particular strategy, or do we just start with the biggest and see how fast we can blow them apart? Han frowned as he got a grip on the control yoke, an odd idea whispering at him. The way that second wave was positioned. You go for that big lead ship, he said. I'm going to try something cute. Luke's reply was a blast of laser fire squarely into the lead pirate's bow. The other ship swerved violently in reaction. Clearly, they hadn't expected this kind of firepower from a simple light freighter. The pilot recovered quickly, though, settling the ship back into its position in the battle array. The entire lead wave moved closer together, closing ranks to get maximum protection from their overlapping shields. Han watched closely, waiting for the obvious next move, and heard the twitter from his display board as the lead ships all shifted shield power to double front, which meant they just unavoidably lowered the strength of their aft shields. Perfect. Chewy, dip and waffle, he ordered into his comm. The Falcon dropped suddenly in response, and for a second, the rear wave of ships was visible past the edges of the first wave shields. Han was ready, firing a double burst past the lead wave into the flank of the biggest second wave ship, sending it into a violent swerve as its primary maneuvering system was blown to bits. And, as it did, the laser fire that had been forming that part of the Falcon's entrapment ring sprayed with shattering forces across the sterns of the lead wave ships. It was everything Han could have hoped for. Two of the smaller ships veered instantly and violently out of formation as their engine sections blew up. The first ricocheted a glancing blow off one of the other pirate ships on its way to oblivion, while the second slammed full tilt into another. They fell away together, with Luke taking advantage of the distraction to blow one of the other lead ships into fiery dust. Then, to Han's shock and disbelief, the Falcon dropped and turned into a curving arc back toward the planet's surface. Chewie! He snarled. What in? The Wookiee growled a warning. Frowning, Han craned his neck to look in the direction Chewie was facing as the familiar shape of an Imperial Star Destroyer swung into view around the dark edge of the planetary disk. Han! Luke gasped. I see it, I see it, Han said his mind racing. Clearly, the rebel cell on Teardrop had gotten out just in time. 
except that the last half a dozen members of that cell were currently sitting a couple of meters directly above him in the Falcon's lounge. If the Imperials caught them here. Then, his brain caught up to him and he understood what Chewbacca had been doing with that last maneuver. Luke, shut down! He ordered, slapping the switches on his own quads. The last thing he wanted was for the Imperials to do a power scan and see that the Falcon had this kind of weaponry. Chewie, give me calm. There was a click. Emergency, he called, putting desperation into his voice. Incoming freighter Argos requesting assistance from Teardrop Planetary Defenses. There was no answer from the ground, of course. Given the shady character of most of the planet's residents and visitors, Han wasn't even sure they had a real defense force down there. But then, he didn't especially care if anyone on Teardrop heard him or not. All he cared about was, Freighter Argos, state your intention and emergency. A clipped military voice responded. Medical Mercy Team from Briston, responding to the recent ground quake on Porsta Island. Han called back. Behind the Falcon, he saw the remaining pirate ships were reforming to continue the attack. Apparently, they hadn't noticed Teardrop's newest visitor. We're under attack! I think they're pirates! Argos acknowledged, the voice said. Hold your present course. But if I do, I... He never got to finish his token protest. Behind him, a two-by-two two group of brilliant green turbo-laser bolts sliced across the pirates' formation, blasting four of the ships into rubble. This time, they got the message. The survivors broke formation and headed off in all directions, some back toward the grounds, other trying to escape into hyperspace. Neither option worked. Calmly, systematically, precisely, the Star Destroyer continued to fire, blasting the pirates one by one until the Falcon was flying alone. Now what? Luke murmured in Han's earphone. Han ignored him. Many thanks, Captain, he called. I'm glad to see the Empire is taking this pirate problem seriously. You're welcome, Argos, a new voice said. Now turn around and go home. What? Han demanded, trying to sound both outraged and stunned. But, Captain! That's an order, Argos! The other cut him off tartly. As of right now, Teardrop is under Imperial interdiction. Go back to Briston and wait until the block has been lifted. Han allowed himself a sigh. <sighs> Understood, he murmured, careful to maintain a straight face. Sometimes a particularly clever and perceptive man could sense a satisfied grin even over an audio comm channel. Not that this particular Imperial appeared to either be clever or perceptive. You heard him, pilot, he continued. Turn us around. Again, Captain, thanks for the rescue. He climbed out of the quad seat and headed back up the ladder. Captain Solo, I demand to know what's happening, one of the passengers said stiffly as Han crossed the lounge on his way back to the cockpit. We're taking you to the rendezvous, Han told him, putting on his best puzzled and innocent look. Why? Before the other could recover enough to try to question Han again, he made his escape. Chewbacca had them well on their way out of Teardrop's gravity well by the time Han dropped into his seat. Nice move, Chewie, he said, as he keyed for a status report. The attack had added a few new dents to the aft armor plating, but considering how many there were already, it wasn't likely anyone would notice. It's always nice when we can obey an imperial order, for a change. Behind them, Luke came into the cockpit. He actually bought it? he asked, leaning over Han's shoulder to gaze out at the Star Destroyer in the distance. Why not? Han countered. He saw us heading in and we told him we were heading in. Sometimes you just have to help people think what you want them to. I suppose, Luke said, still sounding doubtful. They still might have decided to board and search us. Not a chance, Han said. Just because they ride around in big fancy ships doesn't make them smart. They're here to hunt rebels. 
not inspect cargo. Once Chewie had us turned back inward, the only real question was whether the captain would feel like giving his gunners some target practice. Too bad they'll never know what they missed, Luke murmured, taking a last look and then sitting back down. Sure glad you two are on our side. Han frowned over his shoulder, but Luke was peering at the nav computer display, apparently completely oblivious to what he'd just said. Han shifted his gaze to Chewbacca to find the Wookiee looking sideways at him. What? he demanded. The other shrugged his massive shoulders and turned back to his board. Han glanced at Luke again, but the kid had apparently missed the byplay completely. He turned back to his board, a sour taste in his mouth. Our side. Luke's side, in other words. And Princess Leia Organa's side. And General Rhea Khan's side. Probably the whole blasted rebellions. Trouble was, Han couldn't for the life of him remember when the rebellion had become his side. So he dusted those TIE fighters off Luke during that lunatic Yavin battle. Big deal. That had been strictly a favour to the kid. And maybe a little payback for the way the Imperials had dragged him aboard the Death Star and then walked all over the Falcon with their grubby feet. He didn't mind the Rebels being grateful for that, but it didn't mean he'd enlisted in the big cause. Chewbacca was all set to do so, of course. His personal history with the Empire, plus the way they had treated his people in general, had left him with a deep hatred for them. He would enlist in the rebellion in a heartbeat if Han gave the okay. But Han wasn't going to let anyone's passion drive him on this one. Not Chewie and certainly not Luke. He had his own life to lead. The Star Destroyer was settling into orbit as the Falcon made the jump to light speed. With a final burst, more felt than really heard, the reprisal's turbo lasers fell silent. Seated on the port side bench in the number three stormtrooper dropship, Derek Larone notched up his helmet's audio enhancers, wondering if the battle might be continuing with a more distant set of Star Destroyer's weapon banks. But he could hear nothing, and after a moment, he eased the enhancement back down again. Wonder what that was all about, he murmured. Beside him, Sabre and Marcross shrugged slightly, the movement eliciting a slight crackle from his armour. Maybe the rebels tried to make a run for it, he murmured back. If they did, they didn't get very far. Taxtro Grave commented from his seat on the starboard bench, shifting his grip on his long Blaztec T-28 repeating sniper rifle. Look at the bright side. Joke Quiller suggested from beside him. If they're all dead, we can cancel this up and go someplace more promising. Whoever's talking back there, stow it. An authoritative voice called from the front of the dropship. Yes, sir. Marcross answered for all of them. Larone leaned out slightly to look at the scowling officer seated by Lieutenant Kolf. Emblazoned across his chest were the rank bars of a major. Above the insignia was a face Larone couldn't remember ever seeing before. Who is that? he asked, keeping his voice low. Major Drelvin, Marcross whispered back. ISB. Larone leaned back, a chill running through him. The Imperial Security Bureau was the darkest and most brutal of Emperor Palpatine's tools. What's he doing on the reprisal? Someone up the chain must have decided we needed extra help, Mark Ross said. His tone was carefully neutral, but Larone knew him well enough to recognise the contempt beneath his words. They brought in a few ISB men to direct the assault. Larone grimaced. I see, he said, matching the other's tone. From the dropship's cockpit came a warning buzz. Stand by for drop! the pilot called. Drop in five! Lerone looked across the aisle at Quiller, noting the other's subtle squirming. Quiller was himself an excellent pilot, and consequently a rotten passenger. Easy, he murmured. 
Quiller cocked his head slightly, and Lerone smiled at the strained, patient expression he knew the other was giving him from behind the anonymous white helmet faceplate. Abruptly, the bench lurched beneath him, and the drop ship was away. Behind his own faceplate, Lerone's smile faded. His thoughts drifted back to that fateful day ten standard years ago, when the Imperial recruiters had come to Copperline and set up shop. In his mind's eye, he saw himself joining with the other teens as they flocked around the booth, dazzled by the presentation, the crisp uniforms, and the unspoken but obvious implication that this was their best and quickest way off their dead-end little world. Only this time, in his daydream, Lerone said no. He'd believed in the Empire at first, he really had. He'd been ten when the fleet and infantry had come in force and spent five months clearing out the pirate nests that had plagued Copperline for decades. Eight years later, when the recruiters had come, he jumped at the chance to join such a noble group of people. Three years after that, when he'd been offered a spot in the elite Imperial Stormtrooper Corps, he jumped even harder, working and sweating and praying for the chance to be worthy of this ultimate challenge. For six years, everything had gone well. He'd served with all his heart and strength, fighting against the forces of evil and chaos that threatened to destroy Emperor Palpatine's new order. And he'd served with distinction. Or so, at least his commanders had thought. For Lerone himself, awards and citations meant nothing. He was wearing the white armour and he was making a difference. That was what mattered. But then had come Elris, where an entire town had to stand out in the pouring rain for six hours while their identities were double and triple checked. After that had come Bomperil, and all of those terrible civilian casualties as they'd fought to root out a rebel cell. And then had come Alderaan. Lerone shifted uncomfortably on the bench. The details still weren't entirely clear, but the official reports all agreed that the planet had been a centre of rebel strength, and that it had been destroyed only when it defied an order to surrender the traitors. Lerone certainly couldn't fault the motivation. The rebels were growing even stronger, ever bolder, and ever more dangerous. They had to be stopped before they destroyed everything the Emperor had created and dragged the galaxy back into more of the chaos of the Clone Wars era. But surely the entire planet couldn't have been on the Rebels' side? Could it? And then the quiet rumours had started. Some said that Alderaan hadn't been a Rebel base at all, that its destruction had been nothing more than a field test of the Empire's new Death Star. Others whispered that Grand Moff Tarkin, the Death Star's borderline psychotic commander, had destroyed all those billions of people over a personal grudge between him and Bail Organa. But it almost didn't matter what the reason was. The bottom line was that the response had been light years beyond any provocation the rebels could possibly have put together. Something was happening to the Empire that Lerone had served so long and so well. Something terrible. And Lerone himself was stuck right in the middle of it. Ground in three minutes, Major Drelfin called from the front of the dropship. Stormtroopers, prepare to deploy. Lerone took a deep breath, forcing the doubts away. He was an Imperial Stormtrooper, and he would do his duty because that was all that mattered. The first of the speeder bike dropships came to a cautious hover a couple of metres off the ground. As the ramps came down, Corlo Brightwater gunned his Aerotech 74Z speeder bike and roared out into the afternoon sunlight. TBR 479, pull it back! The tart voice of his commander, Lieutenant Natrum, growled in his ear. Reform the search pattern, gents. 479 acknowledged, Brightwater said, taking a quick look around as he turned into a wide circle that would bring him back to the rest of the scout troopers still manoeuvring their way out of the transport. They'd come in on a ground-skimming course just to the north of a set of low, tree-sprinkled hills, 
with the edge of their target town a couple of hundred meters away on the far side. Activating his helmet sensors, he gave the hills a quick but careful scan as he circled back toward the transport. There didn't seem to be activity anywhere of any sort, which struck him as highly suspicious. The hills included a picnic area, several walking paths and half a dozen trees that had been patiently nurtured and manipulated over the decades into an elaborate children's climbing structure. Someone from town ought to be taking his or her leisure out here on such a fine, quiet afternoon. But there was no one. Something, apparently, was keeping the townspeople indoors today. Such as the news of an imminent imperial raid? Brightwater shook his head in irritation. So the whole thing was a bust. The word had leaked, and any rebels who might have been hiding here were halfway to the outer rim by now. Command, TBR-479, he called into his comm. No activity in staging area. The operation may be blown. Repeat, the operation may be... Scout troopers, you are cleared to secure the perimeter. An unfamiliar voice cut in. Brightwater frowned. Come on, did you copy? He asked. I said the lack of activity. TB-479, you will restrict your comments to tactical reports. The new voice interrupted again. All transports move in. Brightwater craned his neck. The stormtrooper dropships were visible now high above him, dropping toward the ground like hunting avians moving for the kill. Only there wasn't anything down here worth killing anymore. A movement to his right caught his eye and he looked back as his partner, Tibran, came alongside. Brightwater lifted his hand in mute question. The other scout shook his head in equally silent warning. Brightwater scowled, but Tibran was right. Whoever this idiot was running things, he was either too single-minded or too stupid to see reason. Nothing now for the stormtroopers to do but go along for the ride and treat the whole thing just as another training exercise. He nodded Tibran an acknowledgement and gunned his speeder toward his designated containment sector. By the time they'd finished their encirclement, the dropships were down, their heavy guns sweeping over the rows of mostly single-storey buildings, their hatches disgorging their complements of stormtroopers and uniformed command officers. Brightwater kept his speeder moving, watching with professional interest as the troops formed themselves into a double ring and converged on the town. For a change, everything seemed to be going perfectly without even the small glitches that normally accompanied an operation this size. It really was a pity there weren't any rebels left in town to appreciate it. The stormtroopers and officers disappeared from view, heading between and into the buildings, and Brightwater shifted his attention to the area outside the scout troops' perimeter. The rebels had almost certainly fled the planet, but there were occasional cells with more audacity than brains who elected to stay behind and try to put together an ambush. Brightwater rather hoped this bunch had gone that route. It would keep the afternoon from being a complete waste, and it would give the stormtroopers the chance to blast them out of here in the open, instead of having to sort them out from the civilians. He had curved to the crest of the nearest hill, his helmet sensors on full power, when he heard the sound of blaster fire from behind him. He swung his speeder sharply around, searching the perimeter on the far side of town, but all the scout troopers over there were still on their speeders, with no indication that anyone was shooting at them. There was another volley of blaster fire, and this time he realised that it was coming from inside the town itself. He brought his speeder to a halt, frowning. The volleys had been replaced by a less organised stutter but the shots all carried the distinctive pitch of the stormtroopers' own Blaztec E-11 rifles. Where was the cacophonous mix of military, sporting and self-defence weaponry that was practically the trademark of the Rebel Alliance? And then, with a sudden chill, he understood. He revved his speeder back to full speed, twisting its nose down the hills and toward town, what in the name of the Emperor did they think they were doing? TB-479, return to your post. 
Lieutenant Natrum's voice said in his earphone. Brightwater flicked out his tongue to the comm's selector control, switching it to the squad's private frequency. Sir, something's happening in town, he said urgently. Request permission to investigate. Permission denied, Natrum said. His voice was under rigid control, but Brightwater could hear the anger beneath it. Return to your post. Sir! That's an order, TB-479, Natrum said. It won't be repeated. Brightwater took a deep breath, but he knew Natrum, and he knew that tone. Whatever was happening, there was nothing either of them could do about it. Yes, sir, he said. Taking another deep breath, trying to calm himself, he turned his speeder back around. The sun had set over the western horizon before the blaster fire finally came to an end. And there ends chapter one of Star Wars Allegiance. One of the reasons that I wanted to reread this book is because Star Wars Andor is really reminding me of it, especially the crimes that the Empire commits against the citizens of the galaxy. This world, Teardrop, is not that dissimilar to Farrix in a few ways, less barren and filled with scrap, it seems, but still a world abandoned and hated by the Empire because of its possible links to the Rebellion. However, the key difference of this being from the point of view of Stormtroopers is very interesting and therefore creates a very different story to Andor. I love both of them. I'd be interested to see how you guys feel that the two compare. Leave me some comments below, and while you're doing that, I'll move on to Chapter 2. The firing range was deserted when Larone arrived. Deserted, that was, except for Grave, standing in the booth at the far end with his T-28 propped against his armoured shoulder. Grave, Larone greeted the other solemnly. How are you doing? For a minute, Grave didn't answer. He kept firing, coolly and methodically, completing the pattern the range had set up for him. Larone watched the monitor as Grave hit crossmark after crossmark with the kind of accuracy expected of stormtrooper snipers. He wondered whether Grave had been called on to use that skill earlier that day. Finally, the blaster fell silent. Grave held his sharpshooter's pose another couple of seconds as the echoes faded away. Then laid the weapon down on the shelf in front of him, and pulled off his helmet. It was like something out of the Clone Wars, he said, not turning around to face his friend. The whole town, everyone, slaughtered where they stood. I know, Lerone said soberly. I was just talking to Colo Brightwater, you know, the speeder scout. He told me he heard the official reports gonna say the rebels launched an ambush during the search. Not a chance, Grave said firmly. I was on rooftop sniper suppression duty and I didn't see a single person so much as poke his nose up there. Even rebels are smart enough to go for high ground in a fight. Maybe, Lerone agreed, feeling a twinge of doubt. Still, I suppose that could have been rebel activity in one of the sections of town I didn't see. Well, of course there could have been, Grave retorted. And since none of us could see everything, everyone can persuade himself that's what happened. Typical ISB foggery. He snapped his T-28 back up to his shoulder and fired off another half a dozen rounds. Only they couldn't stuff up your ears, could they? He growled as he lowered the weapon again. And every shot I heard came from an E-11. I know, Lerone conceded. So were there ever any rebels in that town? Or was this nothing but some bizarre object lesson? Grave shook his head. You tell me, Lerone, he said. All I know. He broke off. Well, from what I could see, it looked like the first ones to be targeted were the aliens. That's how it went down with my squad, too, Lerone said heavily. Not that anyone ever gave an order nearly that specific. The ISB men just pointed and ordered us to shoot. And then watch to see if any of you shot to miss. Lerone felt his stomach tighten. 
That thought had never even occurred to him. Are you suggesting this might have been a test for us? Graves shrugged. From what I heard, ISB never liked the idea of opening up the ranks to volunteers like us. They wanted to keep the stormtroopers strictly clones. Lerone snorted. That was years ago. They really should have gone over it by now. Normal people would have, Graves said slowly. But this is ISB we're talking about. He eyed Lerone. I hope you shot especially straight today. I did my duty, Lerone said stiffly. Grave, you don't suppose ISB knows something we don't, do you? Like, maybe they were all rebel sympathizers in there. You mean like everyone on Alderaan? Lerone's throat tightened. Alderaan. Grave, what's happening to us? He asked quietly. What's happening to the Empire? I don't know, Graves said. Maybe it's the rebels. Maybe they're pushing so hard all the loose seams are starting to break. His lips compressed tightly. Or maybe the Empire's always been like this. Maybe we just didn't notice until Alderaan. So what do we do about it? We don't do anything, Lerone, Graves said, a warning tone in his voice. What can we do? Join the rebellion? The thought flashed through Lerone's mind, but it was a preposterous idea, and he knew it. He and the others had sworn an oath to defend the Empire and its citizens, and there was no way any of them were going to collaborate with people trying to collapse the whole thing back to chaos. I don't know, he said, but this isn't what I signed up for. What you signed up for was to obey orders, Graves said, turning back to the firing line. Popping out his blaster's power pack, he pulled a fresh one from his belt and slid it into place. You certainly didn't sign up to let ISB haul you off for seditious thinking. Well, that's for sure, Lerone agreed, a shiver running through him. Translation, don't ever talk this way again. Because we're supposed to be getting a complete ISB tactical unit in a day or two, Grave went on. Their own transports, their own chain of command, probably their own stormtroopers too. Where'd you hear that? Marcross, of course, Grave said, a wry smile peeking almost reluctantly from behind all his seriousness. Where he gets all his stuff, I haven't a clue. You think he could be ISB himself? <laughs> Not a chance, Graves said firmly. He's way too nice a guy for that. No, he just likes to keep his ear to the sky. I suppose, Lerone said. Regardless, sounds like someone's getting serious about this rebel hunt. That's fine with me, Graves said. And I intend to be ready next time we run into some real rebels. Turning... He put his helmet back on and keyed for a fresh target. He was halfway through the new pattern when Lerone slipped quietly out of the booth. The reception was in full swing. The grand ballroom of Moff Glovestoke's palace, glittering with elaborate lighting and flowing banners and soft music played by a balcony ring of live musicians. Only slightly less glittering, with the rich and powerful filling the room, their collective conversation adding a muted counterpoint to the music. There were at least 500 men and women present, Mara Jade estimated as she drifted serenely past and through the little knots of conversation, the elite of the elite of the entire sector. Glovestoke was definitely pulling out all the limiters tonight. It made one wonder where he was getting the credits to pay for it. Ah, Countess Claria. Maria turned. An older man in a general's uniform was coming through the crowd toward her. A younger man in simple formal wear in tow. Hello again, General Dirian. Mara greeted him with a smile, her eyes flicking over his companion. Mink Bolas. She identified him, one of Glovestoke's aides. Good. If the inner circle was starting to arrive, the moth himself should be close behind. 
I thought you were on your way to inspect the buffet. I was, but then I ran into Master Bolis, General Deerian said, indicating the young man. Remembering our earlier conversation about your world's pirate problems, I thought he might be able to offer some help. Countess? Bolus greeted her, scooping up her right hand and kissing it in old core fashion. His predator's gaze took in her green eyes and red gold hair, shifted to her shoulder sculpt with its interwoven mound of cascading flowers, then dropped still farther to her slender figure encased in its low-cut gown. Pirates and pirate problems clearly were the last thing on his mind. I assure you that Marv Glowstoke and the entire sector government stand ready to assist you in your need. Why don't we find a quiet corner where you can give me some details of your situation? That would be... Mara broke off, letting an uncertain frown pass briefly across her face before smoothing it out. That would be wonderful. Are you all right? Dirian asked. I just felt a little strange there for a moment, Mara said. She let the odd look flicker across her face again, this time adding a slight unsteadiness to her poise. Perhaps you should sit down for a while, Dirian said, eyeing her closely. Ambristine can sneak up on you if you're not used to it. <laughs> I thought I was, Mara said, adding a little throatiness to her voice. In actual fact, she was quite familiar with both Ambrostine and the symptoms that came from drinking too much of it. And Bolus, at least, apparently also knew about the loss of inhibitions that was the next stage. Let me take you someplace where you can lie down, he offered, his eyes glittering a little brighter. He moved to her side, reaching for her arm to assist her. To Mara's mild surprise, Dirian got there first. Martha Glovestoke will be expecting you to assist with his guests. The general reminded Bolus as he deftly moved Mara away from the younger man. I know the palace. I'll find her a place where she'll be safe. Before Bolus could find the right words for a polite protest, Dirian had eased Mara around a couple dressed completely in shimmer silk and headed for one of the side doors. Outside the ballroom, the hallways were deserted except for the pairs of liveried guards standing watch at each intersection. None of them stopped or challenged Dirian as he led her into a darkened office two corridors away. My field officers get their furniture from the same supplier Moff Glowstoke uses for his underlings, he told Mara as he turned the light on low and led her to the room's conversation circle. I can assure you from personal experience that these couches are just the thing for a quick nap. Right now, I think I could sleep in a gravel pit, Mara murmured, slurring the words slightly as she let her eyelids droop. Thank you. No problem, Countess, Dirian said as he helped her stretch out on one of the couches. As I said, Ambrostine is a subtle enemy. I meant, you know. He smiled down at her. No problem there, either, he assured her. You're, what, eighteen? Nineteen? Eighteen? Dirian's smile turned a bit brittle. I have a granddaughter that age, he said. I wouldn't want her alone with Bolus, either. Sleep as long as you want, Countess. I'll make sure you're not disturbed. He left, closing the door behind him. Rolling off the couch, Mara crossed the room and pressed her ear to the door, running through the audio enhancement techniques the Emperor had taught her. Even with that assistance, she could hear only about every other word Dirian was saying to the nearest guard pair. But she could tell he was instructing them, in no uncertain terms, to make sure no one bothered the young lady. The conversation ended, and Dirian's footsteps faded away in the direction of the ballroom. Readjusting her hearing to normal, Mara turned off the light and glided back across the room. Time to go to work. In her admittedly short career so far as the Emperor's Hand, 
Mara had noted the odd mixture of caution and sloppiness displayed by many of the Empire's top politicians. Glovestoke was no exception. Even here on the palace's tenth floor, the windows were protected by an intruder warning grid. At the same time, there was a local release for that grid tucked away beneath the sill so that the office's occupant could get fresh air without having to call the main security office for clearance. A moment's study gained her the key, and, with the grid disabled, she slid the window carefully open and leaned out. Aside from the guards walking their rounds far below, and the distant air cars patrolling the outer perimeter of the palace grounds, no one was visible. Stretching out to the force, she got a grip on the package she'd hidden earlier beneath one of the decorative bushes lining the outer wall and pulled. For a moment, nothing happened. She focused harder, and this time the handle came free and floated swiftly upward, its connecting cord trailing behind it. A moment later, it was in her hands, and... At the touch of a button, the motors inside began reeling in the cord and the much heavier black-wrapped package at the far end. A minute later, the package was inside, its contents spread on the office floor. Two minutes after that, she had exchanged her flowing gown for a grey combat suit, her delicate, flowery shoulder sculpt for a shoulder-slung stockly spray stick, and her embroidered waist sash for a belt and a lightsaber. The packet also included a tube of compressed air and an inflatable mannequin duplicate of her, dressed in formal wear identical to that she had been wearing moments before. She set it up and arranged it on the couch as a decoy for any prying eyes, with her real gown out of sight beneath the desk. She headed back to the window and slipped inside. Mara had been introduced to the spray stick only a few months earlier, and in that time had worked hard to master it and add it to her already extensive repertoire of tools and weapons. The entire gambit, in fact, was one she'd practised over and over again at her training centre in the Imperial Palace. Straddling the windowsill, she pointed the device at an upward angle along the outer wall and squeezed the thumb trigger. There was a sharp hiss and the spray stick snapped back against its shoulder sling as a jet of fine mist shot out of the far end. As it hit the air, the mist turned into a roiling flow of liquid that quickly solidified against the stonework, forming a twist-surface bridge that could be climbed. Shutting off the spray, Mara rotated the stick out of her way on its strap and started up. She had to pause twice to spray additional length to her private pathway before she reached the 20th floor and Glovestock's private quarters. His windows were protected by the same intruder grid she'd found on the office, with the same built-in weakness. Stretching with the force through the transparent steel, she first shut off the grid and then tripped the catch. A minute later, she was inside. The quarters were deserted. Glovestoke and all his people downstairs at the grand party. Still, Mara stayed alert as she moved silently between the rooms. The moth could easily have left a droid or two to watch over his private possessions. But droids could be scanned or reprogrammed, and Glovestoke apparently wasn't willing to take that kind of chance. Instead, he had chosen to rely on two highly sophisticated alarms on his concealed walk-in safe. Sophisticated, from his point of view anyway. The professional thieves the Emperor had brought in to instruct Mara in their craft would have laughed at both systems. Mara herself, not nearly so experienced, merely smiled and had both neutralised within ten minutes. After all the preliminaries, getting the safe itself open was almost an anticlimax. Two minutes later, she pulled open the heavy door and stepped inside. One wall of the safe had been taken over entirely by data card file cabinets, containing the sector's duplicate administration records. Interesting enough, certainly, but even if Glovestoke had been careless enough to leave a data trail that would show his alleged financial irregularities, it would take a small army of accountants to sniff it out. Instead, Mara headed toward the back of the safe, looking for more personal items. And there she found the evidence she needed. 
For a long moment, she gazed at the half-dozen artworks sitting in the beam of her glow rod. At first glance, the private collection seemed rather puny, especially considering the number of flats, sculptures, trestles and volmans decorating the public areas of the palace. Mara wasn't fooled. The pieces downstairs were grandiose but relatively cheap. More importantly, they were comfortably within the budget of an honest administrator of Glovestoke's position. The six pieces in the safe were something else entirely. Any one of them would fetch upward of a hundred million credits from the galaxy's wealthiest private collectors, no questions asked. Taken together, they were probably worth three times the value of Glovestoke's palace and everything in it. Which meant that the Emperor's suspicions were correct. Glovestoke was skimming off the top of the tax revenues he was sending to the Imperial Centre. Picking up one of the flats, Mara turned it around. In the light from her glow rod, the back surface appeared to be plain and unmarked. But there was a little thing art dealers did that Glowstoke might not be aware of. Turning her glow rod to a specific frequency of ultraviolet light, she tried again. There it was, a complete listing of all the dealers and auction houses and brokers whose hands the flat had travelled through throughout its long history. Mara smiled. The dealers made these lists invisible to avoid introducing such crass commercialism into the carefully nurtured elegance of their world. Professional art thieves routinely obliterated the markings in order to make their new acquisitions harder to trace. Glovestoke hadn't done that, which immediately told her he hadn't obtained the art through a professional. Interesting. She made a note of the last listing, Pevan Auction House, Krovner, and set the flat back where she'd found it. She made a similar check of two more of the artworks, then left the safe, closing the door and reactivating the alarms behind her. The trip down the wall was much easier and faster than the trip up had been. The solidified Stockley spray would evaporate in another couple of hours, leaving no trace, even if Glowstoke's men thought to look. She was back in her gown, the rest of her gear hidden against its ground-level bush, when the office door eased open with a cautious crack. Countess, Darian's voice called quietly. Yes, General, she called back, sitting up on the couch and stretching. Please, come in. I trust you're feeling better, the other said, stepping into the doorway. Much better, she assured him, smiling as she crossed to him. Thank you for your thoughtfulness. My pleasure, he said, smiling back as he offered her his arm. Shall we return to the reception? Yes, indeed, she said, taking his arm. Let's hope everyone enjoys it, she thought, as they headed past the watchful sentries. It's the last party Glowstuck will ever throw. So we end Chapter 2 with the seeds of doubt spreading among the Stormtroopers and the introduction of a true classic, Mara Jade, the future spouse of Luke Skywalker and Jedi Lady, the Emperor's Hand currently working for the Sith, but not a Sith herself. And a great introduction there with that spy scene. Very much a kind of James Bond, secret agent style sort of spy with gadgets and stuff. Rather than the more Andor side of things where it's more, you know, sort of like gritty, real world sort of spying. The next chapter is kind of long, so I'm going to move on straight away so that we can get through the video. So here we are for chapter three. Marcross's information, as usual, turned out to be correct. Six days after the teardrop massacre, an ISB tactical unit arrived aboard the reprisal. They arrived in force too. Ten full squads, including soldiers, troopers, droids, even their own intel analysis group. More disturbing to Larone were the two squads of stormtroopers who came with them. Which means that whatever they do, shoot up another town or worse, they'll be wearing our armour which means the whole Stormtrooper Corps will get the blame for it. He warned Quiller and Grave as the three of them gazed down from the observation walkway into Hangar Bay 5. 
the ISB people had brought a strange assortment of vehicles with them, from light freighters to old and outmoded military transports and even a dilapidated pleasure yacht. Not that we're not blind for everything anyway, Quilla added with an edge of bitterness. Comes from our always catching the tough ones. Which comes from our being the Emperor's finest, Grave countered with a touch of pride. We certainly have better transport than these clowns. What do you mean? Those? Quiller asked, pointing at the cluster of ships below them. Don't you believe it, buddy, not for a minute. That Suantec TL-1800, for instance. See those crimp marks on the engine nozzles? Which one are you talking about? The Roan asked, frowning at the unfamiliar designs. That flat, angular job with the oversized sublight engines, Quiller said, pointing. Usually the 1800's a piece of junk. Holds together okay, but it's slow. Badly armed and poorly shielded. The nav computer glitches a lot, too. Sounds perfect for the ISB, Grave murmured. Let's turn them loose and let them get lost. Like I said, don't believe it, Quilla said. Those engines have been upgraded probably six ways from Imperial Center, and odds are everything else beneath the planing has, too. Ditto for the rest of the ships. You suppose they run under false IDs? The Roan asked. Quiller snorted. They probably have whole racks full of them, he said. We may be the Emperor's finest, but you'd never know it when ISB gets up from the budget table. You have a problem with the ISB, soldier? A dark voice demanded from behind them. The Roan felt his stomach knot up. It was Major Drelfin the ISB man who'd ordered the massacre on Teardrop. No, sir, not at all, Quiller assured him quickly. Glad to hear it, Drelfin said as he stalked toward them, his hand resting on the grip of his holstered blaster. Now, you have exactly five seconds to tell me what you're doing in a restricted area. We're Imperial Stormtroopers, sir, the Roan told him, fighting to keep the proper level of military respect in his voice. We're allowed access everywhere aboard ship. Really? Drelfin said, his gaze flicking over Lerone's fatigues. Why aren't you in armour? We've been permitted a bit of latitude in that area, sir, Lerone said, choosing his words carefully. Regulations unequivocally stated that stormtroopers were always to be in armour whenever outside their barracks section. But Captain Ozel resented their presence aboard his ship, and didn't like seeing armoured men wandering around during their off hours. Since the stormtrooper commanders had, in turn, refused to confine their men to barracks when they were off duty, they'd come to a more unofficial arrangement. Permitted by whom? Drelfin demanded. Your lieutenant? Your major? Is there a problem here, major? A new voice said from the far end of the observation gallery. Lerone turned to find Marcross and Brightwater walking toward them, the latter with a rag tucked into the pocket of his fatigues and grease stains on his hands. What is this, the kiddie club meeting room? Drelfin growled. Identify yourselves! Stormtrooper KR-175, Marcross said, an edge of both pride and challenge in his voice. This is TBR-479. Also not in armour, I see, Drelfin growled. Also apparently ignorant of the regulations regarding off-limit areas. He shifted his glare back to Lerone. Or is it that you Border World recruits don't know how to read the regulations in the first place? As I said, sir, Lerone began, you didn't think regulations applied to you, Drelfin finished sarcastically. I trust you know better now. Yes, sir, said Brightwater. He touched Lerone's arm. Come on, Lerone. You gonna help me change the steering vanes on my speeder? Lerone? Drelfin echoed his voice suddenly strange. Darek Lerone? TKR330? Lerone glanced at Marcross, noting the sudden crease in the other's forehead. Yes, sir, he said. Well, well, Drelfin said softly. Without warning, he drew his blaster. I've been going over the records of the teardrop operation, 
he continued, an unpleasant tightness at the corner of his eyes as the weapon came to a halt, pointed at Larone's stomach. Your squad was ordered to execute some rebel sympathizers. You deliberately missed your shots. That's dereliction of duty. Larone felt his throat tighten, so someone had noticed his lack of precision shooting that day. This was not good. My duty is to protect and serve the Empire and the New Order, he said, forcing his voice to stay calm. Your duty is to obey orders, Drelfin countered. They were unarmed and non-threatening civilians, Lerone said. If there were charges or suspicions concerning them, they should have been arrested and brought to trial. They were rebel sympathizers. Quiller took a step forward. Sir, if you have a complaint against this man, stay out of this stormtrooper, Drelfin warned. You're in enough trouble as it is. What sort of trouble? Markross asked. You're out of uniforms. You're in a restricted area without authorization. Drelfin nodded at Larone. And you're obviously friendly with a traitor to the Empire. What? Grave demanded. That's insane. With all due respect, Major, TKR 2014 is correct. Markross cut him off. Regulations require that a charge of that magnitude be brought immediately to the attention of the senior stormtrooper officer. Let me explain something, TKR 175, Drelfin growled. We're the Imperial Security Bureau. What we say is principle. What we decide is regulation. What we do is law. And whoever you order shot is dead. Lerone retorted. So you do understand, Drelfin said, the corners of his mouth quirking upward in a death's head smile. I was in command of that operation, which means I will decide what to do with you. Not your lieutenant, not your major, certainly not your stupid Captain Ozel. He stepped up and pressed the muzzle of his blaster into Lerone's forehead. It was an unfamiliar design, Lerone noted distantly, large and nasty, with an odd-looking attachment at the end of the barrel. And if I choose to summarily execute you for treason, his finger tightened visibly on the trigger. He was bluffing. A small part of Lerone's mind knew. He was toying with his victim in one of the macabre games that these small-minded, sadistic little men enjoyed so much. But Lerone was an Imperial Stormtrooper, ruthlessly trained in the arts of combat and survival, and those deeply embedded reflexes knew nothing about ISB mind games. His left hand snapped up of its own accord, slapping Delfrin's wrist and knocking the blaster away from his forehead. It was probably the last thing Drelfin expected. He stumbled with the impact, snarling a curse as he tried to swing the weapon back on target but even as he did so, Lerone's right hand came up, catching the other's wrist and giving it an extra push. For a single, nerve-wracking fraction of a second, the blaster was again pointing at Lerone's face. Then it was passed, overcorrecting and swinging wide to Lerone's left. He swiveled on his right foot, spinning himself halfway around as he held on to the Major's wrist, and a second later he had Drelfin hunched over, his arm twisted around, the blaster pointed harmlessly at the ceiling. What was that about ISB whims being law? He ground out. Lerone, are you insane? Brightwater demanded, his eyes bulging. Maybe, Lerone said. His anger was draining away, and to his dismay, he realised that Brightwater was right. If he hadn't been in trouble before, he was certainly there now. But that'll be for the proper procedure to determine, he added. Reaching up, he twisted the blaster out of Drelfin's grip, then let go of his arm. Drelfin straightened up, his eyes staring vibra-blades at Lerone, his face contorting with rage, his mouth working with soundless curses. His left hand gripping a small, hold-out blaster. And this time, Lerone knew it was no game. There was a soft flash, a muted blast, without a sound. Drelfin collapsed silently to the ground. For a long, 
frozen moment, no one moved or spoke. Narone stared at the crumpled body, then at the Major's blaster still in his hand, his mind struggling to believe the evidence of his eyes. No, something else had surely happened. The Major must have had a stroke, or a, a heart attack, or perhaps been shot from concealment by some unknown party. That hadn't even sounded like a real blaster shot, for pity's sake. Oh no, Brightwater murmured, sounding stunned. The roan swallowed hard, and with that, the bubble of wild speculation burst, and the cold reality flooded in on him. Derek Larone, with all his high-minded prattlings about duty and honour, had just gunned down a man in cold blood. Not just a man, an officer, an ISB officer. And in that second, frozen moment, he knew he was dead. The others knew it too. It was self-defence, Quiller said, his voice shaking in a way Larone had never heard from him, even in the most desperate combat situations. Y y you saw it! Drelfin drew first! You think ISB will care? Grave bit out. Well, I just meant they won't care, Mark Ross said, his voice tight as he looked quickly around the observation deck. The question is, how serious are they going to be about tracking us down? Wait a second, Brightwater said. What do you mean, us? He's right, Mark Ross, Lerone agreed, his heart starting to pound in reaction. There's no us here. There's just me. None of you did anything. I doubt the ISB will care about that either, Quiller muttered. Of course they'll care, Marcross said heavily. They'll care that none of us did anything to stop you. There wasn't any time. Quiet, Larone, Grave cut in. He's right. We're all for the jump on this one. Not if they can't identify us. Brightwater suggested, looking furtively around. There's no one else here, and he was shot with his own gun. Maybe they'll even think it was suicide. Grave snorted. <laughs> oh, come on. An ISB major at the height of his twisted little career. They kill other people, not themselves. There's only one thing to do, Lerone said. Taking a long step to the side, he brought up his blaster to cover them. On the floor, all of you. None of them moved. A nice gesture, Graves said. But it won't work. I've got the blaster, Lerone said, lifting the weapon for emphasis. There's no way you can stop me, and regulations don't require you to throw away your lives for nothing. No, Lerone Graves right, Mark Ross said, shaking his head. They'll torture us, and as soon as they found out we knew you wouldn't shoot, we'll be right back in the grinder. Besides, you can't fly one of those ISB ships by yourself, Quiller said quietly. At the very least, I have to come with you. At the very least, we all have to, Graves said, his voice heavy. And we're wasting time. I can't let you do this, Lerone protested. I can't ask you to give up everything this way. You'll have to leave the Empire and become fugitives. We haven't got a choice, Graves said. Besides, after what happened on Teardrop, I'm not sure I'll ever be comfortable wearing my armor again. And as for leaving the Empire, Quiller added soberly, It seems to me the Empire left us first. At least the Empire we thought we were signing up to serve. He looked at Brightwater. So, Brightwater, rise and call to you. Brightwater grimaced. I'm not ready to give up on the Empire quite yet, he said. But I also don't want to sit around waiting for the ISB to put me under their hot lights. What's the plan? Lerone looked down at Drelfin's crumpled form, trying to kick his brain back up to speed. First thing is to hide the body, he said. One of those storage lockers over there ought to do it. Quiller, which ship are we taking? The Suantec, Quiller said, pointing to the ship they'd been discussing earlier. Considering our combined mechanical skills, we're going to want the most reliable ship we can get. 
If they were thoughtful enough to leave the systems on standby, I can have it prepped in ten minutes. We can't leave while the reprisal's in hyperspace, Brightwater said. Well, maybe there's another way, Lerone said, an audacious idea tickling the back of his mind. Go get it prepped. Grave, Brightwater, you go with him. Marcross and I will deal with the body. The storage lockers were well packed, but with a little tweaking, they were able to make enough room for Drelfin's body. By the time they'd finished and descended to the hangar deck level, Quilla and the others were already inside the Suantec. Trying to look casual, Lerone touched Marcross's arm and headed toward the boarding ramp. No one challenged them as they strode along, a circumstance that struck Lerone as both suspicious and ominous. They were halfway across before it occurred to him that with the ISB's restrictions in place, there probably wasn't anyone in the hangar bay monitor room to watch the parade. They reached the ship without incident and climbed up into a small but nicely furnished crew lounge. Raising and sealing the ramp, they headed for the bridge. Quilla was in the pilot seat, his fingers tapping here and there as he brought the ship to full life. Where are Grave and Brightwater? Marcross asked as he sat down beside Quiller in the co-pilot seat. Checking to make sure no one's sleeping aboard, Quiller said. Okay, we're ready. He peered over his shoulder at Larone. You said you had an idea. Larone nodded, sat down behind Marcross at the astrogation slash comm station, and gave the controls a quick scan. In hangar comm, there. Squaring his shoulders, Trying to put himself in the mindset of an ISB thug, he keyed it on. This is Major Drelfin, he said in his best impression of Drelfin's voice. We're ready. Sir? A slightly puzzled voice came back. I said we're ready to go, Lerone said, putting some bite into his voice. Bring the reprisal out of hyperspace so we can launch. Ah, uh, um... One moment, sir. The comm went silent. That was your big trick? Quiller muttered. Well, give him a minute, Lerone said, trying to sound more confident than he felt. If they had to blast their way out of here... Major, this is Commander Brillstow. A new voice put in. I see no ship departures on my schedule. Well, of course you don't, Lerone growled. And you won't put anything in your blog report either. Now kindly drop out of hyperspace so we can get on with this. He held his breath. Quiller was right, of course. Standing orders would certainly require that the deck officer clear any such unscheduled requests with the captain, or at least check with someone in Drelfin's own contingent. But the Imperial Security Bureau ran under its own rules, and everyone in the fleet knew it. If Commander Brillstow had heard enough stories of ISB displeasure, and, to his relief and surprise, the mottled hyperspace sky outside the hangar bay faded into the star-speckled blackness of real space. Acknowledge, Major, Brillstow said, his voice stiff and formal. You're clear to launch. Lerone switched off the comm. Let's get moving before they change their minds, he told Quiller. It could still be a trap, Quilla warned as he keyed the repulsor lifts and swiveled the Suantec toward the atmosphere screen. They might just be letting us get outside where they can nail us with the heavy stuff. I don't think so, Marcross said. They wouldn't go for a burned ground endgame without at least trying to take us alive and find out what in blazes we think we're doing. I hope you're right, Quilla said. Here we go. Seconds later, they were outside. Quiller curved up the Star Destroyer's flank, swinging them around behind the superstructure as he headed for deep space. A minute after that, as Lerone watched the tactical display for signs of a last-minute change of heart, the reprisal flickered with pseudo-motion and vanished again into hyperspace. Phew! Quiller exhaled with a huff. It's so nice when ISB's cloak and blade nonsense works against them. Though that doesn't mean we should just sit here and wait for them to wake up, Marcross warned. 
Any thoughts as to where we go from here? I was thinking Drunost might be a good first stop, Quiller said, keying in an overhead display. It's about three hours away. A nice little back world place that happens to have a consolidated shipping hub and outlet, which means it'll have all the fuel and supplies we'll need. It's a long way to the edge of the empire, you know. If we decide we really have to go that far, Mark Ross said. There are a number of closer systems where we could hide. We can hash that over later, Lerone said. Go ahead and get it started for Drunost. Quilla nodded and keyed his board, and the stars outside flashed into star lines. Of course, one question we're going to have to answer before we get there is what we're going to do for money, he pointed out. There was a beep from the intercom. Quilla? Brightwater's voice came. We clear? Clear and free, and the reprisal's gone, Quilla assured him. Great, Brightwater said. You might want to set it on auto and come back to the number two crew cabin, second on your right, just aft of the lounge. Got something interesting to show you. Brightwater and Grave were waiting when Lerone, Marcross and Quiller arrived. Like the crew lounge itself, the cabin was designed with the kind of care Lerone would have expected of men running on an ISB budget. Furnishings included a narrow but comfortable looking bed, a wall locker, a small computer desk, a repeater display over the desk that showed the ship's current heading and overall flight status, and even a small private refresher station. Nice, Quiller commented, looking around approvingly. This one must be the pilot's. It's mine, actually, Grave told him. But don't worry, they're all like this. And if you think this is nice, hang on to your bucket. Brightwater added, stepping to the repeater display. He ran his finger along the underside of the frame. With a quiet snick, a section of the bulkhead at the end of the bed popped ajar, and Brightwater swung it open to reveal a hidden walk-in closet. Or rather, a hidden walk-in arsenal. There were dozens of blasters racked together on one sidewall, Everything from fleet-issue Blaztec DH-17 pistols to standard Stormtrooper E-11 rifles to a pair of holdout blasters of a make and model Lerone didn't recognise. Beneath the racked weapons were rows of power packs and gas cartridges, plus several small bins of assorted replacement parts. On the other side wall was one of Graves' favoured T-28 sniper rifles, plus a selection of vibroblades, grenades, stun cuffs, and a couple of Arachid Hunter Seeker remotes. And, filling the centre of the space, were two complete sets of gleaming Stormtrooper armour. The number one cabin's got a slightly different selection, Graves said into the stunned silence. We haven't checked the others yet, but it's a fair bet they're all tricked out the same way. There are two Aratec 74Z speed bikes in one of the cargo holds, so I figure one of the cabins must have a set or two of scout trooper armor, Brightwater added. That one will be mine. These guys sure came prepared, Marcross commented. I don't suppose they also happen to leave some cash lying around? If they didn't, we can always just rob a bank. Quiller put in dryly, gesturing at the weaponry. We haven't found any credits yet, Brightwater told Marcross. On the other hand, it was pure dumb luck that we found this. We were looking for stowaways, not buried treasure. I think we should remedy that, Marcross suggested. Absolutely, Lerone agreed. We've got three hours to planet for, stormtroopers. Spread out and let's see what else the ISB was kind enough to put aboard our new ship. The final tally was impressive. There were 15 sets of Stormtrooper armour, 8 standard, 6 specialised and a full Space Trooper rig, 50 blasters of various sorts, 100 grenades including shock and explosive and even a pair of thermal detonators, 35 changes of civilian clothing, 2 land speeders, 2 speeder bikes, a 3-seat 6-passenger speeder truck and numerous bits of tracking, 
combat and detention gear, including a small machine for turning out personal identity tags. There was also the rack of false ship transponder codes Quiller had predicted. And there was cash. More than half a million credits. What in the world were they planning that they needed all this? Brightwater muttered as they sat in the lounge comparing their lists. My guess is that they're going for a jab at the rebellion's throat, Marcross said. Disguised freighters will be perfect for infiltrating enemy supply convoys. Or for pausing as renegades who want to join up, Lerone said. Well, whatever they had in mind, it sure puts us in a good position, Grave says. So where exactly on the outer rims are we heading? We could try hot spice, Quilla suggested. The Empire keeps a pretty low profile there, and we could easily pick up a little enforcer or bodyguard work. We're not working for criminals, Brightwater said stiffly. I just meant... No, he's right, Lerone seconded. We're Imperial Stormtroopers, not thugs for hire. But we're not Imperial Stormtroopers anymore, Quilla muttered, tossing his data pad onto the hologame table. We're still not working for criminals, Brightwater insisted. There's another possibility, Marcross offered. Instead of running for the outer rim like frightened Toong, why not stay here in the Shelter sector? Oh, I don't know, Quilla said doubtfully. I looked over the system list earlier, and there aren't a lot of places we could go around without someone eventually noticing us. Unless we kept moving, Brightwater suggested. We've got enough credits to do that, at least for a while. Marcross cleared his throat. Actually, I was thinking we might try someplace on Shokon Wa. Lerone frowned in surprise. From the looks on the others' faces, they were having the same reaction. You want us to hide on Shilsha's capital? Quilla asked. It is the last place the ISB would think to look for wanted fugitives, Marcross pointed out. And I know people there who could help us. But if you have friends there, it's the last place we want to go, Grave countered. You remember the name of the first girl you ever kissed? Marcross snorted. Well, of course. How about the second? Well, no, not really, Marcross conceded. Well, ISB does. Or they'll know soon enough. We're fugitives, Marcross. That means we can never again make contact with anyone we knew. Ever. Let's go a little easy on the long-term planning here, Lerone put in. First thing is to get in and out of Drunost without tripping any alerts. Once we've got full tanks and a full pantry, we can talk more about our options. Marcross still didn't look convinced, but he nodded. Fine, he said but I still want a chance later to make the case for Shokon Wa. And you'll have it, Lerone promised. We'll all have our say, and we'll make the decision together. Like Grave said, the five of us are all we've got. Brightwater shook his head. Why? he said. Does that not exactly fill me with confidence? And that brings us to the end of chapter three, and the end of our video. So, our guys, our stormtroopers have officially done it. They have committed a crime that has ousted them from the Empire. So it wasn't just that they were already having doubts, but now they can't even fit in anymore because the Empire didn't want the soft, namby-pamby stormtrooper who didn't like killing civilians. Me. I really appreciate these guys. I like to see people doing their best to do the right thing. I really appreciate it. And I like that these are people who perhaps did try and see something. They tried to believe in the propaganda. Because the Empire is going to tell you it's the good guy, even though they are space Nazis, as we, the movie viewers, can see quite clearly. But if you're just a kid who's grown up seeing those posters from Imperial Recruitment, yeah, you're going to believe that you're there trying to save the world, save the galaxy, keep everything moving. I already know this story and I really enjoy the arc that these stormtroopers go on 
and it's very pleasing to see. I hope you'll enjoy it with me. So, my friends, I will see you next week for another installment, hopefully. Um, if not, I will also see you again this week for our next installment of the Boba Fett book, Star Wars Slave Ship. I do hope you enjoy. But while you're waiting for that, make sure you are listening to part two of Halo the Flood, read by my good friend Gilbert, here from the Fulcrum Entertainment Podcast. Thank you very much, knights. Subscribe, like, all that jazz. Keep an eye out for our live streams that we do on the weekend. There's plenty of them for you to come and hang out with us. And I will see you next time. But remember, we are all Fulcrum. <laughs>